Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Srinivas. I am a chemical engineer by training and I am an assistant professor in the department of energy science and engineering at IIT Bombay. Um, among many other interests that I have, uh, one of the topics I am looking at is converting waste plastic into fuel oil through pyrolysis. So, what I will try to share with you over the next half an hour, 35 minutes is why we started looking at this problem and uh, what can one think of if you still want to work on this and what are the avenues for further innovations etc. Needless to say this slide here tells you all the difficult uh, or the some of the worst photos that you can see in which plastic is there in the background ok. So, in almost all these cases you will see that plastic is littered around not only on just land but also in the water bodies ok. Uh, so, it spoils the aesthetics of the nature ok. You can also see some animals in this case there is a cow that is trying to eat this plastic or the waste paper cups etc. ok. So, time and again it has been uh, written in newspapers you might have come across in news saying that animals ingest this plastic then they choke to death. So, these are some of the problems that we have with rampant waste plastic disposal ok. So, around 311 million tons of plastic was generated in 2014 and 60 to 65 percent of this actually goes to a dumping site just after the first use which means that even if there is some option of recycling people are either not aware of it or they just do not take the effort of recycling it ok leading to this problem. So, just to list down so you have environmental issues with soil water and air ok. So, water it chokes up your drains causes uh, pollution etc. With soil these plastics are not really uh, quick biodegradable they take lots of years to degrade, but during this degradation they release a lot of toxins which leach through the soil and then they can enter the crops and through that into the food chain of different animals and humans ok. Uh, so, that is why there has serious environmental issues with it. Health hazards as I said for, is for both human animal and marine life it is not just the cow that I showed you in the photo, but even fish that in try to ingest this plastic ok. Uh, I am sorry I could not put a photo, but there is something called as a Pacific gyre which at least some of you would have heard of ok. Um, these are large rotating whirlpools in the oceans that we find ok. And because of the turbulence of the water and ocean currents the plastic is actually diminished or brought down into very fine particles ok. So, the fish ingest these and then they also get all kinds of diseases. So, health hazards are in the form of respiratory, coronary diseases, cancer etc. ok. Uh, unfortunately, four fifths of the accumulated garbage in the world's oceans ok. That is because 70 percent of the earth is also filled with water. Um, there is a nice statistic which actually says that uh, in a couple of years from now in terms of mass we will have more amounts of waste plastic in the ocean than the total weight of all the fish put together. So, you can just imagine the amount of plastic that we are using ok. All right. So, what can we do with all this waste plastic? So, this slide shows you two different options that you have. So, one is recycling which is on your left and the other one is right on the right which is energy recovery ok. So, when you say recycling what you are talk, uh, trying to do is you take some of these waste plastics these are sorted, crushed, washed right. So, you basically do some preliminary processing you again process them into granules or smaller particles from which you can make new products ok. The other one is the energy recovery option in which you are actually destroying the plastic and making either fuel or electricity out of it. So, our project here is mostly dealing with the right hand side of this schematic which we will talk about in a couple of minutes ok. So, just a couple of examples on how people have done this mechanical recycling. So, this is one of the creative ways in which plastic is managed ok. Ok, do you think where plastic is involved in this picture? Any answers? Yeah, that is a football player, but where do you think waste plastic is tied up with this picture? Surface ok, pardon? Shin guard ok shoes ok. So, 
polyethylene terephthalate PET. Most of the water bottles that you see are made of PET. Okay, so when you do mechanical recycling, you crush those bottles, melt them, and then you can make fibers which go back into making of these polyester shoes. Oh, sorry, the shoes for this. Uh, there are also companies which actually make the player T-shirts out of this waste plastic. Okay, so that's what. So it's not some small companies, but actually big brands like Nike and Adidas which do this. Okay. So this schematic here shows you that a bottle is getting transformed into a shoe. Okay. Uh, back home in India, there is a small startup or let's say entrepreneur who has actually looked at converting waste plastic into 3D printing filaments. Okay. So they actually collect some of your waste bottles, especially made from HDPE, crush them, melt them, and then draw filaments out of it, which can be used for 3D printing of small things to set up examples, etc. Sahas is another company which uses plastic waste to actually make uh, kind of corrugated roofings, etc., which you can use for construction. Similarly, there is this company which use which mixes recycled polystyrene along with nanofibers made from orange peel extract to make clothes and a variety of things. Uh, last two examples on mechanical recycling, which is uh, there is this company which has developed a micro emulsion that can separate layers of multi-layered packages. So you are putting plastic back into use and then this is a company that is trying to convert plastic into construction bricks. Okay? And they claim that it is more stronger than concrete bricks. Okay? So this is all about mechanical recycling. So there is enough market for this. Uh, but when we talk about chemical recycling or making plastic into fuel oil, there should be a different motivation for us. So in all these things that you see here, there are different alternatives for these products actually. Okay? So plastic is trying to compete with them. But on the other hand, if you look at the way plastic is manufactured or created, uh, what do you think is the major source of making all your plastics? Where does plastic come from? Okay, so crude oil is the major precursor or the raw material to start for getting your plastics. Okay? So in a refinery when people are manufacturing gasoline and diesel, there is a lot of lighter components like ethylene and propylene that come out as a byproduct. Okay? So the refineries then sell it off to their other companies, typically the petrochemical companies who then polymerize this and make your polyethylene, polypropylene and all other kinds of plastics. Okay? So you are going from petroleum to plastic and what we are now saying is you convert that plastic back into oil. So you are now trying to complete the chain again. Okay? So there are two things this, uh, that you do here. So virgin oil that is used or um, which is used for powering your automobiles etc. no longer need to be supplied from a refinery. Okay? You can actually use waste plastic to get some of your fuel oil okay, or diesel or gasoline. Now I will tell you why we should try for fuel oil or diesel or gasoline uh, in a short while. Okay. So not just oil, you can also think about different products here. So these are all possible existing solutions for utilization of waste plastic. So the first one is landfilling which is a big no no. Okay. We are trying to move away from it because land comes at a very premium cost and you do not want to put waste on the land. Okay. So this is a big no. Incineration is when you take any combustible matter and try to burn it off at very high temperatures, close to 900,000 or even 1200 degrees centigrade. The trouble with this though is you need very strict uh, emission controls okay? and that comes with a large expense. Typically for any incineration plant, 40 to 60 percent of the capital cost goes into just the emission controls. Okay? So if there is some utility who wants to sell electricity, they would not be really willing to spend so much money on trying to control the emissions. Okay? Uh, the third schematic that you see here is dissolution, which is you can dissolve some of these plastics and get back the monomer or the starting block. Okay? Uh, but then what do you do with so much waste solvent? How do you choose the proper solvent? There are more questions here than the answers. Okay? Mechanical recycling is what we just talked about when we looked about uh, all those products. Okay. So there are two more existing solutions here which are called as thermochemical solutions. Okay. So there are two keywords in this which is use of heat and uh, some kind of reaction. So that is why you call it as thermochemical. The one on the left is gasification, the one on the right is pyrolysis. 
to keep it simple you can think of gasification has a reaction in which you have partial supply of air ok. So, let me just quickly go back here. So, incineration as I have said was complete combustion ok. So, you have either the amount stoichiometric amount of air which is enough air to burn your fuel or a little above that ok. But when you go to gasification you are having air that is less than the complete combustion. So, you are not actually completely burning your fuel which means that you will get carbon monoxide and hydrogen as the product instead of getting carbon dioxide and water vapor ok. So, that mixture of gas is what is called as a syngas which you can again burn to get electricity. So, you are generating power starting from your feedstock. On the right you have pyrolysis which is again a thermal pyro, uh, method, but in this case you are running it completely in the absence of oxygen. So, when we went from incineration to pyrolysis we are cutting down all the air supply ok. Uh, gasification occurs at around 900 degrees, pyrolysis is around 300 degrees centigrade. So, it is it requires much lesser heat input ok. So, in terms of the energy inputs that you require this seems to be a benign candidate ok and that is why among gasification and pyrolysis we have decided to work with pyrolysis ok. So, what is pyrolysis? So, essentially in the absence of air you are applying heat to decompose all these large molecules ok the one that you see here let us say this is a large plastic molecule you break them down into smaller molecules. Now, depending on the size of the molecule and its molecular weight they can be either in the form of a liquid in which case you will get pyrolysis oil or in the form of a gas which is called as pyrolysis gas or you can get solid residue in the form of carbon black ok. Interestingly all these three products have some market value ok. So, you can use the pyrolysis oil or the fuel oil in your generators instead of diesel ok. If you are able to purify it further you can get it converted into either diesel or petrol and you can use them in your IC engines or your uh, automobiles. Pyrolysis gas has some calorific value ok. This process requires some heat ok. So, instead of supplying heat from burning a different fuel or using electricity you can intelligently design this process. So, that the pyrolysis gas is burnt and it supplies heat to this reactor. So, you are making the process self sufficient in terms of energy ok. The residue that you get has lots of carbon present in it. So, again it is of interest for tire manufacturing industry who can use it in uh, fillers for the carbon black industry etcetera. So, all the three products that you get out of pyrolysis namely liquid gas and solid have some uh, economic value to it ok. Uh, you could also have a catalyst in this process ok instead of just using heat you could also use a catalyst to speed up the process as well as keep or operate your reactor at a lower temperature. Ok. So, where is the innovation or the intervention part in this process now ok. Uh, pyrolysis is, is something that is not really very new ok. People have been doing biomass pyrolysis, plastic pyrolysis for a lot of year, years ok. Uh, it is almost a three decade old field I would say ok. So, towards the end of this lecture I will be showing you a short video from a company who is actually doing plastic pyrolysis ok. But if that is the case why do we need really need the innovations or interventions that that is the question ok. And the second question is if for 30 degree uh, 30 years this technology has been around why do you still see so much waste plastic around ok. Ok, so that brings me to just one small question. So, can anyone have a guess on how much of the world's total plastic that is generated so far has been recycled? any percentage guess. Let us assume that 100 tons of plastic has been manufactured so far since the inception of plastic. How much do you think has been actually recycled? Pardon? Yeah, so you are close to it. So, almost 80 to 85 percent has actually been dumped in the world somewhere the other either in the landfills or oceans etcetera only 15 percent is the recovery we are talking about ok. And we are talking about countries which are very well developed have 6 or 7 different bins to separate all different kinds of plastics etcetera ok. But unfortunately if this technology is around why did that happen that is the question ok. 
so it so happens that these processes are very good when they operate at really large scale, but if you want to do it at a large scale you have to collect all this waste okay, and take it to one centralized processing unit and before you do that you also need segregation. Okay. So, the first hurdle is segregated waste that you require. Okay. So, your plastic has to be kept separate from all the other kinds of waste that is the first problem. Okay. Now, the second question then is if countries in Europe have this good segregation system why is it not working there. Okay. So, it so happens that this is a capital intensive process you still need money to build these plants and run them properly there is still some emissions control that you require on this okay and people are very scared about what is the amount of oil that you get out of it okay so in a short while i'll tell you the trouble with different kinds of plastics so there are opportunities for innovation and intervention and that is why we said we'll work on this from scratch we'll understand what people have done and then we'll go ahead with this so in this schematic here there are different uh, processes that you will see. The first thing that you can see here is waste plastic going into some kind of a feeding mechanism. Okay. So, the feeding system itself is one of the troublesome things in your uh, plastic pyrolysis. Okay. You start with a solid and once you start heating it, it actually melts okay. and then you have to heat it further so that it is converted into gas reacts and then condenses back into the liquid. So, how do you have a feeding system which avoids this choking? So, most mechanical people would be aware of extruders etcetera which run around 200, 300 when you get the melt out, but when you want the melt to now increase in temperature up to 500 will that same screw survive or how do you modify the design ok. So, those are all the challenges in these screw feeding systems that you have to think of ok. The next big one is the reactor itself where there is more than one parameter uh, which is listed here. So, what should be the right operating temperature for this? at what rate should you heat this reactor ok. You can heat it 5 degree per minute, 10 degree per minute. So, the, if you heat it at a slower rate you need longer time, if you heat it at a very fast rate you need less time, but you may not get the product yield. So, and each plastic behaves differently. So, what is really a very sweet spot for most of the plastics is what we need to look at ok. Uh, and then you have this whole condensation and separation system. Uh, plus uh, sorry for the color there is an ash tank that is shown here which is essentially the residue ok. So, how do you remove of this residue and remember the challenge is we have to do all these operations in an inert atmosphere or in the absence of air you do not want air, air ingress happening at any step of the process ok. Uh, so, based on this what we thought is we will do some experiments with real plastic waste in the lab because most of the scientific literature has looked at virgin plastics ok, but do they behave the same way as waste plastic probably not because when you start with a virgin pro plastic let us say poly uh, ethylene or something and you make a bottle out of it you add some additives into it either to impart color or to make it increase its mechanical strength etcetera. So, those additives may actually hamper or uh, disturb your kinetics ok. So, try experiments with real waste plastic and see how they compare with virgins, virgin plastics ok. Uh, from this we want to develop a kinetic model essentially a model to do scale up of the process which is our ultimate goal ok. Uh, can we alter the process design or use a different catalyst ok. In most technologies that use a catalyst the catalyst is actually thrown away along with the residue ok, but catalyst actually is expensive and comes with a cost. So, how do you reuse this catalyst is another uh, intervention or innovation that one can think of ok. Behavioral change for segregation as I said is the first step that one should look at ok. So, I would say that our project is taking it for granted that uh, in, in time there will be a behavioral change and segregation will happen or we would try to devise a strategy where people will segregate things and there is an economic benefit to it ok. So, whenever we talk about fuels the other difficult issue is you have to compete with other emerging fuels coming into the market ok. So, again as you might have seen uh, prime minister is now trying to encourage use of ethanol in your petrol ok. So, this is bioethanol it is coming from sugarcane molasses. So, biofuels. So, how does this plastic fuel if at all 
needs to compete with biofuel, where does it stand? Okay. So, ethanol has a lot of oxygen present in it, which kills down its calorific value or you drive lesser number of kilometers with it. Okay. Whereas, your plastic fuel is free from oxygenates and water content. So, it is much more advantageous than the alcohol that you have. Okay. Uh, since your plastics do not have any sulphur, your plastic based fuel also does not have any sulphur. So, you really do not need to worry about any sulphur emissions. Okay. So, these are some of the good things that uh, you can think about. Even if you use it in a generator, you do not need to worry about sulphur emissions etcetera. So, let me now slowly start getting into how we choose what are the plastics that you can use etcetera. Okay. So, when people talk about plastics, there are so many things. Okay. So, number 1 to 7 is the typical uh, numbering scheme that is accepted uh, worldwide. Okay. So, 1 is polyethylene terephthalate, 2 and 2 is high density polyethylene, 4 is low density polyethylene, 3 is polyvinyl chloride, 5 polypropylene, 6 is polystyrene and then 7 is others which can include polyurethane and a lot many other things. Okay. And uh, this schematic just shows all the different products in which they are being used. Okay. So, starting from small things like plastic cups to office school or holders, PET bottles, PVC boots, plastic has just come into our lives everywhere. Okay. Living without plastic would really be, you cannot imagine. Okay. So, you have to live with it, but at the same time we have to be environmentally conscious and see how we can save the environment. Okay. Okay. So, polyethylene terephthalate has a very good recycle market. Okay. So, if you have PET bottles lying around, you will see many rag pickers just taking them off, okay. can be mechanically recycled. Polyvinyl chloride is a very bad feed material for plastic pyrolysis. Okay. When you try to heat this thing up, it releases hydrogen chloride, which is harmful not only for the environment, but also it damages your process vessels, etc. Okay. Um, and moreover, the use of PVC has now come down. Okay. So, PVC typically used to be used in agricultural pipes, these boots, etc. All these are now being replaced slowly with polypropylene. Okay. So, over the years, we feel that PVC production or the consumption is going to come down. Okay. Uh, so, our emphasis therefore has been mostly on polyethylenes, okay, both these types polypropylene and polystyrene. So, we said we will look at these three plastics as the feedstock and then look at how we can design a system to work with this. Okay. So, this is just a summary of it. So, you will see that polypropylene, polyethylene and polystyrene together contribute to around 80 percent by weight in the municipal solid waste. Okay. So, if you are able to make good use of this to get oil, you have taken care of a significant amount of the plastic waste in the municipal solid waste. Okay. Uh, these for the reasons I stated are really not suitable for pyrolysis. Okay. So, PET goes to mechanical recycling, PVC you have to think of alternative ways. Okay. Okay. Now, literature says that all the four plastics that we took would give around 80 percent yield of liquid by weight. Okay. So, of every 100 kg of plastic that you take and do pyrolysis, you will get around 80 kg, which is still a good value. Okay. But if you look at PVC or PET, it is very bad. So, you do not really want to get there, even if you want to do it. The other good thing is this has a very nice calorific value of around 46 to 47 megajoule per kg, which is comparable to that of your kerosene or petrol oils. Okay. So, it can clearly be a very good substitute for this in terms of the calorific value or the energy content. Okay. So, given this I said, uh, so we asked ourselves, let us try to look at waste plastic and see does it really give the same yield as what people have reported in literature for the virgin plastic. So, we performed some experiments, looked at the important parameters like temperature and heating rate and then uh, can we optimize these conditions. Okay. So, this is what we have inside the lab. Okay. So, we really wanted to do some very quick experiments and at the same time not have very large amounts of raw material. So, what you see here is a very small reactor, it is a 250 ml quartz glass reactor that can withstand temperatures of around 900 degrees centigrade. Okay. Uh, this is a furnace in which you insert this reactor and let the pyrolysis happen. So, this is working in a batch mode, which means you put plastic inside, you heat it up and then you condense the gas uh, that is coming out. 
there is an outlet for the non condensables which you collect in the balloons that you see here okay and then you can take out the oil weight analyze it to see what are the fractions etc okay uh, these are some of the raw materials that we have used and done this okay so i would like to bring your attention to this thing here the catalyst which is fcc spent so as I said one of the problems with this process is the cost okay and catalyst typically is a significant cost for any chemical process. So can you do some innovation or intervention there. So spent FCC catalyst is something that the refineries actually throw out okay. So FCC stands for fluidized catalytic cracking it is a process in the refinery that is used for making gasoline okay. After a couple of uses this catalyst is no longer used by the refiner okay. So it is a kind of waste product for them you are taking a waste from a different industry and using it as a raw material or as a catalyst in our process okay. So this is another innovation that many people are thinking of which is if you have different waste from different industries can you somehow gel them together and make a benign process out of it okay. A similar thing you can uh, think of is red mud that comes out of the alumina industry okay that's a lot so whenever you do bauxite refining there's a lot of red mud that is left which many people have tried to use as a catalyst okay off late people have been trying to use fly ash coming from the thermal power plants as a catalyst so these are all different uh, areas that one can think of okay okay so quickly going to the raw material so this is virgin polypropylene and this is a waste bucket or bond vita jar that is made of polypropylene okay. Uh, when we look at LDP this is bubble wrap you can have milk bags coming from different companies uh, in terms of HDP these are the carry bags that are being banned currently okay so a lot of them and then uh, for the polystyrene you can use expanded polystyrene or styrofoam so expanded polystyrene is the thermocol the big white ones that actually break off which is typically used in your fall ceiling okay. Styrofoam is the one that is kind of flexible and is normally used in some of the computer packaging etc. Okay. okay. So and as I said we got our spent FCC catalyst from Indian Petrochemicals Limited Gujarat. Okay. Without getting into main too many details what we wanted to understand is we wanted to see where these plastics degrade if you are going for different heating rates. Okay. So we tried two different heating rates 5 and 10. At 10 degree centigrade per minute the decomposition happened at around 473 whereas at 5 it was 462. There was really not much difference in the temperature okay. So I can have slightly higher temperature but with a faster heating rate which is better for me it will increase my throughput because I can then process more plastic within the given amount of time. So we said let us go with the 10 degree per minute and 473 okay. Uh, as I said we also then wanted to see how these wastes actually compare with the virgin polymers that people have reported okay. So this schematic here is for polypropylene you will see that there is not really much difference in the degradation temperature okay. 473 for virgin and 480 for waste which may have some additives in it okay. So it is not really off by a lot. Uh, similarly um, you have two kinds of polyethylene LDPE and HDPE they are off by around 6 degrees centigrade. And then when you go to polystyrene you will see that there is a significant difference between the two different kinds okay. So the thermocol which is brittle okay actually starts degrading at 426 but the styrofoam which is more flexible uh, is around 500 degree centigrade okay. So this is becomes now a catch so if you have if someone says waste polystyrene then it becomes necessary for you to ask is it styrofoam or is it expanded polystyrene because of this difference in temperature and this is something that people have not reported in literature okay. So these are some findings that we started coming through and this could possibly be one reason why some of the technologies are failing okay because you assume that any polystyrene will degrade at this temperature but then when you start getting styrofoam it does not work you require higher temperature whereas your reactor is not designed for it okay. But what we also tried to see is uh, what is the composition of the plastics itself okay. So when you are talking about converting materials you would also want to know what is the can you completely convert 100 kg of any of this waste plastic into oil okay. Uh, unfortunately what happens is if you look at HDPE okay 
around 10 to 20 percent of it is ash ok. So, of every 100 kg of this raw material that you have 10 to 20 kg would be not converted no matter what you do you will not be able to convert this ok. So, you should not actually try to design a reactor or believe in someone who will say that he will convert this entire HDPE into oil ok. You are bound to get this residue because it is inherent characteristic of the raw material ok. So, these are some of the things that we started uh, finding out which were really not reported in literature or there was not a one to one correspondence between the feedstock characteristic and the yields they were getting. So, quickly looking at this what you see is uh, between the virgin and waste polymers ok, this is polypropylene on this slide, the yields were really not off by a large amount ok. So, that gives us confidence that you can work with waste plastic. Uh, we got similar results for many things, but it, uh, for LDPE things started behaving differently ok. There was almost a 10 percent difference which means that there is clearly a uh, innovation or intervention that is possible here ok. Uh, we just quickly looked at the analysis of the liquid to understand what is going on here. So, what you will see is when you have a catalyst it gives you more olefins rather than paraffins and also the aromatics goes up ok. So, in terms of comparing this with your petrol or diesel this is more close to petrol ok. So, if you use a catalyst then you can confidently say that your oil is more closer to the uh, spark ignition engine rather than uh, sorry yeah the spark ignition rather than the compression ignition engine. Because in the end you also have to tell your consumer who is going to buy this oil where he wants to apply this. Uh, okay. So, this is as I said HDPE where you will see this blue line is the residue. So, the minimum here is 22 percent. So, no matter what you do there is always some residue that is coming which is explained by the feedstock itself ok. Uh, and then this is the interesting thing about the styrofoam and EPS ok. So, between the two different polystyrene products you will see there is a large difference in the amount of liquid that you get. So, if one were to design a plant based on yields from EPS and he gets more styrofoam then you are producing less oil and therefore, your economics will fall apart ok. And we believe that this is some this is one of the reasons why some of the plants are not able to function well ok. Uh, catalyst deactivation is another trouble with this thing ok. So, whenever you use a catalyst you also have to take care of what is happening. So, in this case after using it only once you will see that there is almost 10 percent carbon that is present ok either with waste HDPE or with waste propylene it is 5 percent ok. So, how even if you want to reuse this catalyst how do you reuse it that is the question that one should try and answer. Do you want to regenerate it or since it is anyway waste product from someone else you just let it go and get more of the catalyst ok. Because if you want to regenerate it it comes at the expense of an energy. It is also tied up to the question of whether you want to recover that catalyst or not ok. Uh, we also looked at two stage pyrolysis which is you just melt the plastic here and then let the vapors actually get in contact with the uh, vapors. So, that the catalyst life gets extended ok. So, all this has been mostly on the catalyst and the reactor design issues ok. Uh, and interesting the most difficult part in this is what happens when you start mixing two different kinds of plastics ok. I have been talking only about a single plastic which had so many problems ok. Now, when you start mixing them you will see that their behavior is highly nonlinear. ok. So, you cannot just take an average yield of the two mixtures and say this is what is going to be your oil yield it seldom works that way ok. So, in that case how do you develop a robust model that can predict what these yields are etcetera based on the limited experimental data that you have. So, the experiment planning of the experiments also becomes very important in this case ok. Uh, so, these are some of the conclusions that I already discussed while explaining. So, right now where we are is we are mostly done with studying the interaction effects of different plastics how if, uh, what happens when you mix them ok. Then effect of plastics having same base polymer is essentially if you have those expanded polystyrene, styrofoam, HDPE, LDPE, different grades etcetera how do things change ok. Uh, so, right now we are trying to move to a scale up version of this where we are trying to see 
how we can avoid the feeding issues, okay, how you can remove the residue, is there a way of recovering the catalyst, etc. There are some ideas that we are trying at. Uh, Okay, so these are just the quick references. Okay, uh, I should acknowledge Tata Center for Technology and Design, uh, which had given me this opportunity to work on this project. Okay, and these are all the students who have not only just worked but also put together these slides. Okay, and Nitin is a collaborator that I work with in uh, Maharaj MS University at Vadodara. They have a polymer division there, so he is an expert in the polymers who helps me. Okay, thank you. So, can I just play the video and then we will have some questions, is that okay? Almost half the plastics that we use are thrown away after just a single use. The problem is there is no away and plastic can take hundreds of years to degrade. So every single piece of plastic that has not been recycled still exists. I'm Oliver Steeds and I've come to Ireland to investigate how we can convert our waste plastics into fuel. We live in an age of plastics. Polyvinyl chloride is found in anything from pipes to window frames, polypropylenes in margarine tubs, even fibers for carpet, polystyrenes in building insulation and protective packaging. And we find polyethylene in anything from our plastic bottles to bin liners. They all have one thing in common. They were once oil, a mix of chains of carbon and hydrogen, which all have different properties depending on their structure. Much of this waste can be recycled into new products but some of it, known as end-use plastic, currently has no second life and ends up in landfill, where it can release hazardous chemicals into the environment. So what plastics can be used for fuel? This is an example of the type of plastic that we're sending away now to be used as a fuel. Uh -huh. So what we have is various colours of plastic, red, greens, blues and whites. Uh, it's hand-picked out from the, from the paper and the rest of the material and it's bailed up. This is Sinar in Port Leash, Ireland where end-use plastic is given one more life. Some of the plastics end up here in Sinus Processing Plant. Michael's the CEO. Michael, what are we looking for here? Well, these are bales of plastic that come in from waste management companies into us for processing uh, into diesel fuel. So what this normally would go straight into a hole in the ground. It doesn't make any sense. Right. So we, what we have to do with this now is reduce it, size reduce it. So it comes into us like this, like that. Size reduce it, so it's uh, the correct size to go into the process. It makes it easier to handle. Cyanar can process one ton of end-of-life waste plastic every hour and turn it into this, a mountain of 15 millimeter flakes of clean plastic, where it's sucked up through this industrial vacuum and piped into a furnace. So you can feel the heat from here. Um, this is a simple, what is happening is the, the material is being delivered in. There's a screw mechanism and it's being pushed whilst heated along this barrel. It starts life at around 180, uh, at 300 degrees, 300, 310, it's leaving this, the, this particular extruder. And it's like, a, it's like a hot chewing gum consistency. The plastics are now ready to be converted into fuel. Well, we're looking down here really to the heartbeat of the process. It's the pyrolysis vessels. We are heating the material up to a vapor temperature of about 385, 410. That then uh, produces a hydrocarbon vapor. The key point with pyrolysis is that there is no oxygen present, so the superheated plastics can't burn. Instead, the molecular bonds of the long carbon chains that make plastic what it is break apart, returning them to the various smaller hydrocarbon chains that they were created from in the first place. The different length hydrocarbon chains can then be separated. The vapor that uh, comes off the pyrolysis vessels, passes through a unique uh, baffle arrangement that's inside these contactor vessels here. So we're cracking carbon chains. So the heavy material is not allowed to leave and join the vapor line to the distillation column until it is, has the correct profile. What happens in the distillation process? The hydrocarbon vapor that leaves the top of the contactor vessels then travels through a vapor line, um, and that vapor line then arrives uh, into our distillation column. Um, in there, the condensable material then is liquefied and we take off our diesel fuel off the bottom of the distillation column. Further up the column then we have a, our light oil um, and then our non-condensable gases leave the top of the distillation column. And it's those gases that we clean and uh, use in the furnaces to heat the pyrolysis chambers. How efficient is this process? For every tonne of plastic we get about 800 litres of diesel. 
When I think of plastic, I often think it's very toxic. Uh, what happens to all those toxins? Well, we are not burning plastic, we're, we're heating and paralyzing plastic. So we're producing a vapor rather than uh, oxidizing the material when you burn it with a flame. The only byproduct is a non hazardous char, the pigments and fillers from the plastics that Cyanar hope will soon be given a second life as either man made tiles or pigment for decorative concrete. Well, I now have a litre of diesel, but I want to put it through some tests. So I brought in a team from University College Dublin. So what we'll do is we'll show you the performance of it, running on the emissions of it, running on normal diesel. We'll put some of this fuel into the tank. We'll run the test again, and we'll show you the performance and the emissions running on the synthetic diesels. Key ones will be carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, yep. Uh, hydrocarbons, HC. Yep. And oxygen. now I've got the comparative figures. One of the most striking things is this hydrocarbon mm. footprint. Yeah. 499 mm. parts per million. Yeah. On conventional diesel, and with synthetic diesel mixed in, mm. it's 294. What does that mean? What it means is, quite simply, the fuel, the synthetic fuel is burning more efficiently. And carbon dioxide. There seems to be a massive reduction in carbon dioxide emissions using synthetic fuel. Because that's mainly due to the dilution with the oxygen. As you saw, the oxygen went up in it. So again, because the fuel was burning more efficiently, the engine's doing the same amount of work, but using a little bit less fuel. So, Doctor, overall, your assessment? The assessment of the fuel, the synthetic fuels, it's definitely one of the fuels for the future. It's a nice, clean fuel, clean burning, as you saw from the emissions. The key benefit is that you're recycling carbon. So carbon that might have gone in the plastic, gone into landfill, or been disposed of by incineration, it's now been recovered. It's been used as a synthetic fuel, which means you don't need to take as much fossil fuel out of the ground. We have a saving on that. We can use those fossil fuels for maybe something else in, in the plastics industry, in the pharmaceutical industry. Cyanar are currently able to produce 10,000 litres of synthetic fuel a day in this plant, but they're soon opening up new and bigger plants in the UK. With 15 million tonnes of plastic still going into landfill in Europe every year, they're not short of their raw materials but the political and consumer mindsets need to catch up. The vast majority of plastic waste is still not recycled, but there does seem to be a solution here. If only society and industry can look at end-of-life plastics, not as a waste, but as a product that has value and something that does have use. OK, so what you actually saw in that video is a very large-scale plastic pyrolysis plant. It was just not one plant, actually. So there's one plant where which was getting all the raw material, they were segregating the plastic, they were baling it with the right kinds that can go to the pyrolysis unit. And then the bales were sent to the actual plastic pyrolysis plant, which were again cut open, shredded and fed to the reactor. Okay. Um, so this is a small plant in Ireland and uh, they seem to be working well, but uh, I haven't actually at least on the net found a subsidiary or any of their plants in the rest of Europe or US. So it looks like there's a lot of policy and regulatory in, uh, intervention also that is needed. Um, but from an Indian perspective, what we are thinking is, can you have or can you design these plants at a much smaller scale or at a modular level, which can be set up with somewhat uh, lesser capital cost and can still do the job for you. Okay. Okay, so you can think of it in uh, two directions. So one is you can try to uh, get a new process altogether, which is like as I showed, can we work with a two-stage pyrolysis, which will increase the longevity of the catalyst? Can you modify the reactor design itself so that uh, the feeding and the disposal systems become uh, more amenable? And third one is, can you just develop a new catalyst which will increase the yield? So, um, so we, as I said, we started looking at the spent FCC because it is a waste coming out from another industry. The reactor is a small reactor where you can do quick runs. And uh, since my background has mostly been chemical and I am not really a conversant with the screw kind reactors or the screw reactor design, we went with this. But you can look at screw type of reactors and work on that. Okay. Procurement of catalyst, if you want the waste FCC, I think you can just contact the refineries. They should be willing to give you. I mean, they just throw away tons of it. We are hardly asking for a few kgs. Yeah. If you still have a problem, you can write to me. I will try to see if I can help you with it. Yes, sir.
So plastic oil, okay, so uh, to answer your question also. So what you see, you saw in the video is um, after they got the oil, he was mentioning about a process called distillation. So you can actually separate the oil into a lighter oil and a heavier oil. The heavier oil was more close to diesel, which he actually put into the automobile and tested. Uh, the lighter one can go into the petrol blending, okay. But as I said, if you want to operate the distillation column, you again require some extra equipment, there is extra capital cost, operating cost in running those. Uh, what we feel is a more cruder version can actually go in for operator, operation of the gensets, the diesel gensets or the smaller kind of a machinery because it is a modular unit, you just have enough oil that can uh, feed in a small industrial cluster. For health, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so curcuma has plastic. So curcuma is okay. So most of the plastics that we see, especially the packaging, etc., is not just one plastic, but there are multi layers, which are uh, put together for a variety of reasons. And then there's also an aluminium layer that is stuck to it. What I could not show you in this short thing is when you have these aluminum wrapping or wrapper in the plastic, significant amount of the residue is actually that aluminum, okay. Because even if you go to 500, 600 degrees centigrade, the aluminum, it just does not do anything to the aluminum. The melting point of aluminum is quite high. So, how then do you separate the aluminum actually, okay. Uh, okay, and then coming back to your question. Typically any polymer which on degradation will give you uh, dioxins and furons or has uh, a component called as bisphenol A is claimed to be dangerous to human health. These are like pre good in the sense, I mean you should avoid it, uh, but I would say they are more benign than some other polymers which are or plastics which are even more harmful. I mean if we look around, uh, people have invented plastics and are using it for a variety of reasons, okay. So there are many plastics which are used as flame retardants. So essentially even if a furniture or something catches fire, it makes sure that it does not spread very fast, okay. And those are coated on most furniture, etc. No, in the atmosphere, those things actually start like escaping into the air and they are present. So, we can't get away with it completely, but that's why we are looking at this host of technologies to try to minimize their emissions into the air, water, or soil. Um, and even for most water bottles nowadays, if you see, most of the good ones will say that they do not have this. Uh, BP, bisphenol A, it will be written that it will be, they will write it as BPA free, which means that it does not have that harmful chemical. So, I mean I am not exactly a polymer person, but you can get more information from people who actually work in the polymer area itself. Yes sir. Okay. Uh, good question. So, unfortunately, it is also a complicated question to answer because this depends on what the crude oil price, okay. So, as I said, plastic is made from uh, crude oil, okay, the raw material. So, two years back, we were visiting an industry who was using industrial waste plastic to convert into fuel oil, okay. Uh, so, not just the municipal solid waste, there is a lot of industrial waste plastic that is lying around, uh, mainly from the extruders and all these industries which make these plastic bottles, etc. So even that goes in as a feedstock for making oil. Now what that gentleman told me was, uh, so that was when oil was almost like 40, 45 dollar per barrel or something. So he was actually saying that uh, people are really not interested in taking this oil because the crude oil price is so low, why would someone want to process this and make petrol or diesel out of it. So, it is directly tied to the crude oil price, okay, okay, thank you.